This strange story happened in Canada in 1992. It shows the ingenuity of criminals who are ready to do literally anything to avoid punishment. In this case, they even managed to change the DNA results. How did it happen? You will learn from this strange story. 23-year-old Candy lived in Kipling, Canada, Saskatchewan province. Candy raised her daughter alone. Her parents helped her raise the child, thanks to which the girl could work. On the evening of October 31st, Candy was finishing work. She was visited by her boyfriend with whom she had a huge argument. A very nervous Candy got into her car and, having no better idea, drove to her friend who worked at the local hospital. Unfortunately, her friend was not at work, but one of the nurses, who was concerned about Candy's mental state, called the doctor on duty. Candy happened to know him well. It was John Schneeberger, her family doctor. Dr. Schneeberger is a very nice man, he was considered a great specialist, and of course, very well known in the small town of Kipling, where he enjoyed universal respect and sympathy. Candy tells him that she is upset because of the recent argument. She expects to be given some sedative pills, so she's a little surprised when the doctor gives her an injection. Her attention is also drawn to the fact that the injection has a very strong effect. After a while Candy feels paralyzed, and when she tries to move, it turns out that it is actually impossible. So the woman tries to scream, but she is unable to make any sound. Candy is very scared. Her consciousness is impaired, but Candy thinks someone is taking off her panties. However, he does not see this person. She also feels like she is being raped. When some time passes and Candy slowly recovers, there is no one else in the doctor's office except her. She realizes that her crotch is wet. Her thoughts and movements are still slowed, but the woman is so affected by what she has experienced and so conscious that she decides to keep her underwear as evidence. So she takes off her panties and puts them in a transparent plastic bag that she finds in some drawer. Candy feels dizzy. A nurse appears in the office and when she sees Candy, she persuades her to stay in the hospital overnight. Candy agrees and stays until the morning, but she hasn't told anyone about the rape. The next day Candy went to Dr. Schneeberger and in a raised voice asked, What the hell did you give me last night? The doctor responds calmly and only asks if she had any bad dreams. Candy realized that this was the reaction of a person who was pretending and would continue to pretend that nothing had happened. The woman ran out of the office. Straight from the hospital, Candy went to her parents and told them about the previous night's events and her suspicions. The parents believed their daughter's story and said they needed to act immediately. Candy went to the city of Regina, which is two hours away from Kipling. There was a clinic there with a ward intended specifically for rape victims. Candy wanted to take a test there. Doctors at a clinic in Regina find traces of semen on Candy's panties worn at the hospital the night before, on her jeans and in a swab taken from her vagina. A blood test shows Candy's presence of an anesthetic called, Versed. This medicine has a muscle relaxant effect. After taking it you cannot speak or move your limbs. This matches the symptoms the woman had the previous night. Candy officially filed rape charges against Dr. John Schneeberger. This information caused a storm in the small town of Kipling. First of all, many residents considered it a lie. Dr. Schneeberger was a respected member of the community and was never accused of any such act. Many people suggest that Candy, as a single mother, wanted to be in a relationship with a wealthy and married doctor, and when this failed, she is now taking revenge and trying to extort compensation from him. These people emphasize that Candy's story had many unclear moments, and what was particularly strange was that after the alleged rape, Candy, who stayed overnight in the hospital, did not mention anything to the nurses. John Schneeberger had to somehow respond to these accusations. So, to divert suspicion and at the same time put an end to any discussion as quickly as possible, he agreed to take a blood sample for DNA testing. The test result was clear. The doctor's DNA did not match the DNA from the sperm on the underwear and on the vaginal swab. Candy was shocked, but at the same time so convinced that she was right that she didn't give up. In the months that followed, she sent complaints wherever she could, insisting that there had been some tampering with the DNA test at the hospital. In August 1993, the doctor, feeling the pressure, 
declared his willingness to undergo another DNA test. In the hospital laboratory, a nurse takes his blood, but this time the entire procedure is broadcast live and observed by investigators from the Kipling police station. The police clearly see how the needle is inserted into the doctor's arm. Test tubes with blood samples are immediately delivered to the police medical laboratory. However, the test result is identical to the previous one. The doctor's DNA is different from the DNA from the samples found on the underwear and on Candy's body. DNA tests are irrefutable evidence, and in the Candy case it was the second test. The police inform the woman that the investigation will be discontinued. Candy protests and continues to insist that something is wrong. But now most people at Kipling believe that the woman is either a fraud or simply mentally unstable and is harming Dr. Schneeberger and his family. Lisa, the doctor's wife, is on her husband's side and also thinks Candy is a fraud and a trickster. Dr. Schneeberger tells various people that the explanation for how Candy felt after the injection is the effect of the drug he gave her. This drug could cause hallucinations, in this case of an erotic nature. According to Candy, this explanation might even be acceptable, but the effect of the drug probably does not explain the presence of sperm on her body and underwear, since as she has repeatedly assured she had last had sexual intercourse many weeks before that fateful night. Despite widespread condemnation from the small community, Candy was convinced of the doctor's guilt and continued to act, but this time on her own. She hired a detective who broke into Schneeberger's car. The detective was supposed to find anything that could be suitable for DNA testing. He finds hair on the back of the driver's seat. He also took protective lipstick from the car. As it turned out in the laboratory, the hair is not suitable for a DNA test because it has no hair follicles. But there are epithelial cells on the lipstick from the person who last used it. DNA is isolated from them and, for the first time, the laboratory has good news for candy. The DNA code on the lipstick matches the one that had the material taken from Candy. Candy finally felt that something was starting to add up, even though the matter was problematic. Firstly, it was impossible to clearly prove that the doctor used lipstick. Secondly, evidence obtained illegally does not count in court anyway. But if we assume that the cells from the lipstick belong to Schneeberger, a fundamental question arises. Why is their DNA different from the DNA of his blood cells? Candy trying to find any avenue for further official action, files a complaint against Schneeberger with the Medical Association. After the complaint is received, Schneeberger is forced to consent to another DNA test. The test takes place in November 1996. This time the test takes place in a police forensic laboratory, and the entire procedure is videotaped. Schneeberger is nice and willing to cooperate. When the doctor wants to take blood from his finger, the doctor refuses he explains that due to his condition, inserting the needle causes blue bruises. Therefore, he prefers the needle to be inserted higher, around the elbow, because the bruises are easy to hide. The problem seems a bit strange, but the doctor voluntarily agreed to the test and cannot be forced to do anything. So the doctor sticks a needle into his left forearm, but no blood can be drawn. She tries a different syringe and finally succeeds but something's wrong. The doctor says, there's something strange about this blood. It doesn't look fresh. The laboratory also declared that the blood was not suitable for testing. Candy is furious. For her, this may have been her last, hard-fought chance to prove her DNA match, and the lab clearly messed something up again. However, the woman cannot do anything for now because the police have no grounds to initiate another case against the doctor or to take further action. Half a year later, that is. On April 25, 1997, Dr. Schneeberger's 15-year-old stepdaughter, that is, his wife's daughter from her first marriage, announced to her mother, Mom, I have to tell you something. Then she led her mother to her room and showed her a used condom that she found in her bed. The girl adds, Mom, he did this to me before, too. The teenager claims that her stepfather came to her room at night many times in recent years and gave her injections. Lisa, the teenager's mother and Schneeberger's wife, was shocked but immediately took action. She went to her husband's office, where she quickly finds a box with condoms, needles and medicines, including Verst. Lisa reported the matter to the police. Schneeberger is arrested and must take another DNA test. 
This time, many samples are taken, hair, saliva, blood, this time from the finger, not the forearm. All three DNA profiles match those found on Candy's body. One question remains, how the doctor managed to manipulate DNA samples in previous tests, especially since both the laboratory technician and the police observing the tests confirm that the needle was definitely inserted into his vein. But this question is finally answered by the accused himself. In November 1999, during his ongoing trial, John Schneeberger explained that he had inserted a 15-centimeter plastic tube containing the blood of one of his patients under the skin of his forearm. Naturally, this was why he was so insistent on not drawing blood from his finger during the third examination. In the video from 1996, you can see that Dr. Schneeberger pulls up his sleeve very carefully, and not too high apparently he wants to keep the place with the test tube covered. But when you zoom in on the frame, you can see for a moment how the test tube stands out under the skin. When this third DNA test was performed, the blood in the test tube was already five years old and dark, and this is what made the doctor distrustful. During the trial, Schneeberger denied raping Candy. He claims that the woman probably broke into his house, took a used condom and smeared its contents on her clothes. The doctor explained the use of his patient's blood as follows. He did it because he saw no other option to defend himself. Despite these explanations, Dr. Schneeberger is found guilty of raping Candy and misleading law enforcement agencies. He is also found guilty of raping his stepdaughter and sentenced to a total of six years in prison. In 2003, after serving four years, Schneeberger was conditionally released from prison because his Canadian citizenship has been revoked. Schneeberger was born in Zambia and received Canadian citizenship in 1993. He leaves Canada and returns to South Africa. And that's the end of this strange story. Fortunately, thanks to Candy's persistence, she managed to prove the doctor's guilt. If you want more videos, please subscribe to my channel. Stay safe.